Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Jeanette. Thank you very much. Can you see my presentation? Yes. And also, uh, ooh, I think I'm going too fast. Yeah. Is yes. this good? Is this good? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your kind invitation, Luke, and also Irina to participate in this in this event. I'm really happy to talk about migrant bodies and cultural transfer um, and how narratives of migration can counter cultural stereotypes. Um, and what I would like to do first, uh, as Irina already said, um, first I would like to present the context of my topic, which focuses um, on Franco-Iranian literature. Um, but what is um, interesting is also that uh, this is part of a larger project that I'm working on, on Iranian women's writing in Europe. And that's why I was so happy that Paola also mentioned Kader Abdullah. Um, and I just can't help it. I have to show you, I don't know if you can see it, um, I also have to show you a very interesting book uh, written by a, a, a woman Iranian author in Dutch, The Hemel is Pash, The, uh, the Hemel is also Pash. Um, so I just want to tell you that, you know, there's, there's more than Kadr Abdullah, but I understand that, you know, he's uh, the most well-known author at, at the moment. Uh, now, with, with regard to, uh, uh, to France, I want to first talk about uh, briefly uh, Iranian diaspora in France in relation to the framework of migrant bodies um, and cultural transfer. And in the second part of the talk, I will give two examples of counter narratives um, dealing with cultural stereotypes that in particular female migrant um, characters are confronted with um, in their host country, but also in their country of origin. So, so I'll give you some examples of that. By discussing um, the process of going from self-assessment, which is followed by putting on a mask, masking the self, and develops into expressing and uh, redefining the self. And I hope um, through this process to demonstrate how narratives in which the migrant body plays a central role, can ultimately defy cultural stereotypes um, and present a new image of the other, which in this case is the um, female character from Iranian descent. And just a few words to conclude uh, in the end. Now, first, um, since the uh, Iranian uh, or Islamic revolution of 1979, Millions of Persian speaking uh, peoples have migrated to other parts um, of the Middle East, US, Europe, other areas of the world. And you can see here on the image that the biggest Iranian uh, community is located in the US. And we also find the majority of studies uh, that focuses on, on the Iranian diaspora in the United States. Now, studies on Iranian communities in Western Europe are scarce. Um, and I've been looking into this and it might be related, I think it's related to the fact that they are relatively well integrated in their host societies. Um, there is also less media coverage um, in comparison to other minorities, which make them uh, less visible as a group. Um, but at the same time, the few studies that have been conducted demonstrate fairly high levels of discrimination, and it appears that the um, Iranian group experiences little acceptance by the majority population of the host countries. Now, in my talk today, I'm particularly interested in the way in which fictional narratives of the Iranian diaspora present um, experiences of migration, from a female perspective and focusing on the Franco-Iranian uh, writing, women's writing in particular. The estimated number of Iranian immigrants in France is around 25,000. Now this is an estimation since France does not conduct surveys um, asking its citizens for their uh, ethnic or national identity since everyone is considered being French. Now, looking at uh, Franco-Iranian relations historically, um, the birth of a Francophone elite eager for literature, for French culture, was at the origin of a migration that can be traced back to Montesquieu's Lettres Persanes, uh, Persian letters, in 1722. And then in the 19th century, we can talk about um, uh, knowledge exile when French was recognized as the official language of administration 
uh, in Iran and many um, students left for Paris to study administration. And then we move towards um, uh, the exile of the political refugee in the 20th century. And now historically, the uh, Iranian Francophone diaspora nurtures on, as we as we saw on cultural, professional, also political affinities, more than the needs of a work migration. Um, and this would also be the very fabric of the motivation of migration since 1979, since the revolution of 1979. The origin of departure, mainly political reasons, but also linked to um, the Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s. As far as, this, as the socioeconomic profile um, is concerned, the population of migrants is essentially from an urban middle class, more or less cultivated, generally qualified, well aware of the Western way of life. Now, with regard to geographical distribution, um, the majority of Iranians, 70%, live in Ile de France. So this is partly explained by the strong politicization of this diaspora because it finds uh, structures which enable uh, to keep up with the Iranian politics more easily in the Paris region than in the, than in the province. As um, Vida Nassi Benam has observed, many Iranian immigrants decided to go to France because of its reputation of being a terre d'asile, a country of asylum and protection uh, where they would like to stay until it would be safe to go back home. So this desire to return home means, according to Nassi Benam, that the migrant is in constant state of waiting to return, never really able to feel at home in the host country. And this is reinforced by the feeling of continuously being othered, being considered a stranger, une étrangère. When comparing um, the situation of men and women of Iranian descent in France, it's interesting to note that two thirds of the women and one third of the men are economically active in comparison with their previous situation in Iran. A large number of women are able to secure their place in French society by becoming economically active, uh, participating in language courses, by joining the local schools, a parent committee, for example. And um, as a result of migration, gender roles are changing, family relations are shifting. Um, and it's also important to note the differences between first and second uh, generations. Uh, the second generation often uh, suffering from a feeling of being in between uh, cultures. Now, I'm particularly interested in how these experiences of migration are translated uh, in narrative. Um, so this is a different form of translation, but, uh, but still I would like to use the word. Uh, and in order to further explore this, I would like to build on two notions that Sarah Ahmed uh, discusses in her book, uh, Strange Encounters, uh, two notions that of the other uh, and that of the body. Ahmed mentions that the crucial uh, role that encounters play in shaping the migrant experience, um, the encounter uh, with the other, takes place through movements of contact and conflict and, as she says, are played out on the body. The migrant subject becomes aware of its difference uh, that is established as a relation between bodies and this bodily experience is necessarily a painful one. Um, the migrant body feeling displaced and lost and it suffers from being the other that does not belong. Uh, by adopting what Madeleine Hron has called a rhetoric of pain, uh, I think I argue that it's possible to express the suffering, both bodily and mental suffering, in a meaningful way, uh, because the body can take control over its suffering, and narrating pain then becomes an act of agency and empowerment. Now, we must be aware of the fact that this is probably easier said than, than done because narrating this pain is a long process that is in itself 
uh, painful with different phases uh, that confront the migrant body over and over again with its difference and strangeness. But when this process is successful, um, when the uh, migrant subject engages with contact and conflict, a redefinition of self uh, will be possible. And I'm adding the word uh, reconciliation here um, to also transcend the idea of self, um, the self becoming part of two different cultures. And uh, we could even uh, maybe speak of a reconciliation of cultures and ultimately the result of uh, the narrative of pain, as you could call it, is to counter stereotypes, to present new images uh, of migrant womanhood and to create um, meaningful uh, encounters that reconcile the self and the other. Um, and we could even say that then the, the, the narrator becomes a mediator or a transmitter um, between cultures. Um, now, this whole process uh, seems to be particularly valid for female uh, narrators, despite the emancipa emancipatory developments that I mentioned earlier, so Iranian migrant women finding a place uh, in French society, they still suffer from a persistent, um, from persistent stereotypes that either categorize them as oppressed victims of patriarchal oppression, the veal being a symbol of this oppression, uh, or as uh, exoticized, even eroticized women, an image that very much corresponds to the 19th century uh, representation of Oriental women from an Orientalist perspective. Now, in their narratives, women authors position themselves in relation to these stereotypical uh, representations by situating the migrant, migrant body in between two cultures and languages that seem to be irreconcilable. The conflict is played out, I argue, on their bodies um, and their stories finally develop into a rethinking and reorientation of these cultures, including key aspects such as gender and sexuality. And by presenting the migrant experience as such from within, uh, they develop ways to uh, counter the uh, uh, the two stereotypes or, or you know the stereotypes based on this um, dichotomy that that I just mentioned um, what I would like to do is just briefly um, illustrate this um, referring to two counter narratives and the two texts that I would like to uh, discuss today with you uh, as examples are Negar Javadis Désoriental and Maria Majidis uh, Marx et la Poupée, Marx and the Doll. Um, and earlier Luc told me that maybe, um, you know, French uh, might not, you know, be known to, to everyone in, in the audience. So I'll try, I have quotations in French, but I'll, I'll try to um, also uh, translate them. Both books have been published in 2016. The two protagonists are girls fleeing Iran uh, with their families at a young age. Kimia in Désorientale. Um, Désorientale actually has been translated into English uh, as Désoriental. Uh, she's 10 years old and Mariam from Marx et la Poupée is only aged six when they leave uh, for France. And of course their flight from Iran is a traumatic, disorienting experience. Um, and this feeling is also expressed in the structure of the books. The narratives are non-chronological. The many flashbacks create an effect of fragmentation. Past and present events are not always clearly distinguished and memories allow for the protagonists to travel not only between past and present, but also through their narratives, in their narratives, between the country of origin and the host country. Their disoriented identities are uh, reflected in uh, the way they react to the new and sometimes 
incomprehensible French culture and encounters um, often highlight their status of being different and strange. And as I, I hope to demonstrate in a minute, their feelings of alienation are uh, primarily expressed through their bodies. I would also like to stress the uh, ambivalent role of language, um, since the fact that they have to learn a new language can create opportunities for countering stereotypes, uh, establish relationships, addressing the host audience, but the fact that they will never speak French uh, as a native speaker uh, also confirms again their difference. So this ambivalence is always present. Um, what I would like to uh, present here, what I'm presenting here as, as a linear process, going from self-assessment to masking the self uh, in order to ultimately express the self, are stages that, that can take place at different moments in the protagonist's life. So it's not necessarily a, a, a chronological uh, development, but I, I will present it like this um, for the sake of clarity here. Now with this phase, first phase of self-assessment, uh, we see that for Mariam, this happens shortly after her arrival in France, when she is confronted with French cuisine, which she disgusts and the French, French language that is constantly in conflict with her Persian mother tongue. Now for Kimya, the phase of self-assessment mostly takes place during her adolescent years when she has left home and hides herself in the Parisian underground, um, underground scene where no one asks questions about her identity, about her origin. Um, let's have a look at some examples that you, that you see here, some quotes that you see here. So, the oppressive environment of the school canteen in Mariam's case is described in the chapter, Moi je ne mange pas, I'm not eating. And this illustrates the way in which the new culture is literally shoved down Mariam's throat uh, and her refusal to swallow anything produced by the French kitchen is met with retaliation. Not only the food itself, um, is met with disgust. The little girl also does not like the culture of having lunch together in the canteen. Uh, she feels that the concentration of children is oppressive, that eating habits do not encourage Mariam to eat. Um, so that, that's the second quote. Je hais cette concentration d'enfants dans un même lieu. Je hais cette promiscuité. Je hais leur chalutage, leur cri. Je hais leur façon de manger. So the repetition of the, the word hate uh, is quite clear here. Um, so she deactivates her tongue. She closes her mouth in order to reject the French food and even the French food culture. Uh, that presents itself as incomprehensible and distasteful, but she also becomes silent. So the French word for tongue, langue, also means language, uh, which marks another sign of difference. Uh, and she, because as a language learner, she distinguishes herself by her inadequate language use. Um, and as a result, she wants to be, she needs to be proficient, before feeling truly confident to speak, to speak up. Now, until that moment, she remains silent. She only speaks to her classmates in her head. Elle imagine des dialogues. She invents dialogues, but never really talks to them. The refusal to speak and, 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 and eat makes her, as it were, invisible. She retreats from society to disappear. Now, this is also something that Kimia's Kimia does, that's also Kimia's reaction um, to her outsider status. Uh, her accent and grammatical errors are an incentive for painful moments, as is her Iranian origin. And that's the first quote. No one misses the foreigners. Personne ne rate l'étranger. No one can resist the cheap pleasure of scratching that itch of difference. Uh, Plaisir poisseux de gratter là où il y a différence. Language is the easiest way to catch the immigrants out and to corner them, the le coincé. So with regard to her origin, uh, Kimia realizes that the French have a disastrous image of Iran uh, as an imaginary country full of Muslim fundamentalists um, of whom I suddenly became the representative. Dont je devenais, she says, uh, soudain la représentante. So during her adolescent years, Kimia increasingly starts to avoid this painful reality by looking for a place where 
euh, l'Iran et la France n'existaient pas, where Iran and France do not exist. And she immerses herself in the Parisian underground scene where no one asks um, where she's from, nor corrects her grammatical errors, and she goes into hiding away from her family, away from her roots, and from that what she has uh, come to see as her foreign face. Um, the feeling of foreigners' difference is something that Kimia has felt ever since she was a little girl growing up in Tehran. She has learned to pretend to be someone else during childhood, trying to act and be like other girls, to adhere to the Iranian model that, uh, to the model that Iranian society presents her. And the first shocking experience is when she's getting ready for her first day in school. She looks at herself in the mirror after being dressed uh, in the new clothes her mother brought uh, for the occasion. And then what she feels is so strange and uh, unexpected. Que je reste comme pétrifié, so she's like paralyzed. The sense of being dressed up as a girl and the sudden awareness that I was one. Déguisé en fille et la conscience d'en être une. So uh, she has a feeling of estrangement here. The feeling is quickly joined by panic at the thought of having to go to school dressed like this and behaving accordingly. Then at the age of 10, she learns why she feels so different from the other girls. She learns about her sexuality in a brutal way. Preferring to play ball with the boys, she initially sees no harm in the fact that she has little in common with other girls until the day that one of her sisters whispers a word in her ear that turns her world upside down. Her sister murmurs it in French so that no one else will understand because it causes too much shame. Uh, lesbienne. Ça suffit maintenant. Franchement, arrête. On dirait une lesbienne. Um, Kimia and her sisters attend a French school uh, in Tehran because her mother uh, has studied in, in France um, uh, during her, her years of study. Um, and so this is where they have learned French already. Um, on dirait une lesbienne. Now Kimia realizes that she is excluded by the other girls. Um, the word means she has become monstrous. Une chose monstrueuse. Uh, and her first reaction to this exclusion uh, from the cultural norm is to appropriate it, no matter what it takes, to change into a new form uh, in order to turn into a girl like the other girls, pour que je devienne une fille comme les autres. She desperately wants to fit in, decides to put on a mask and adhere to the Iranian norm of clear gender distinctions. Uh, we see that um, this is ingrained in, in uh, Iranian society, as Kimia explains. You are either a boy, boy or a girl, there's no in between, um, no other possibility. Personne ne sait comment élever l'entre deux, and you cannot choose yourself. So Kimia masks her sexual identity for years, hides who she is, um, even denies who she is. And there's also denial in the case of Mariam. Mariam gives up her resistance, starts to eat and speak again. Yeah, so we've seen that her first reaction uh, is stop, stop eating and speaking. She starts eating and speaking again, but she does deny her Persian origins as a result of the process of self effacing imposed on her uh, since her arrival in France. In order to avoid questions about her identity, she puts on a mask that complies with the stereotypical image of the romanticized immigrant other. Je me cache, cache derrière un masque, celui de l'exilé romanesque. So what does she do? She plays the part of the exotic oriental woman, particularly during her encounters with French men. Je module ma voix, je mets mon costume de femme personne, je secoue mes voiles. So the silent girl has turned into a talkative young woman who seems to outshout her suffering. Je me faisais conteuse devant un public avide d'histoires exotiques. So she has this audience that avidly listens to her exotic um, stories. Um, she seems to have given up her initial resistance by playing along, by conforming to the stereotype that goes back to the 
Orientalist paintings of uh, Delacroix, uh, presenting uh, lascivious women, as in the painting Femme d'Alger dans leur appartement, for example. And she mocks her short-sighted French audience, um, who understands nothing about contemporary Iran, but she also betrays herself by hiding behind her, behind a mask. Her inner voice keeps telling her that's not really who she is, that's not the real Marianne, and this feeling is confirmed by the vision of her grandmother that appears to her during difficult moments, and, and this goes, this happens throughout her childhood and, and adolescent years, whenever there's a difficult moment, there's the vision of her grandmother, and at this time, she, grandmother advises her to tell her stories differently, to really pay tribute to her Persian background. And the grandmother presents herself as her native language, Persian. Je suis ta langue maternelle, her mother tongue, who waited for her and who encourages her uh, not to hide but to express her pain. Laisse ta douleur uh, s'exprimer. This is not an easy task, but Mariam decides to take up the advice and narrates not only her own story, but also that of family members who have suffered oppression in Iran, stories that are embedded in its, in its history. Je uh, déterre des souvenirs, des anecdotes. So by digging up numerous stories of suffering um, caused by the uh, experience of immigration, but also um, uh, caused by religious and political oppression, in her home country, the narrator engages in a cultural rhetoric in which um, self-expression has taken the place of hiding. And what she does in her, in her storytelling is combining and paying tribute to different literary traditions. Um, she includes references to Persian poets, Hafez and Hayam, for example, quoting them. She also refers to Francophone literature, to the Franco-Iranian author Chadot Javan, and also to the French literary canon, for example, authors like Proust and Hugo. And thus, I think she starts reconciling the Persian and French um, cultures in, 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 her, in her text. Um, for Kimya, it's essential to come to terms with a hybrid body. As Ahmed argues, uh, migrant bodies inhabit a space that is neither within nor outside uh, the bodily space. And the void or absence uh, resulting from migration and bodily estrangement can be, Ahmed says, re-inhabited um, through friendship with others who also know, recognize uh, uh, the, the strangeness, uh, are recognized as strangers. What's interesting in Kimia's case that it's not um, the uh, encounter with other migrants, nor with the outsiders from the underground scene, but her acquaintance with another stranger to the heterosexual norm enables her to re-inhabit her disoriented body. She establishes a lesbian relationship with her Flemish girl, Anna, that develops with intermissions and is confirmed by the desire to raise a child. This results in the narrator's acknowledgement, um, not only of what she once thought was her physique bizarre, um, but also of her migrant body, the acceptance of her body as her only country, mon seul pays, ma seule terre. And that, I think, coincides with the acknowledgement of her disorientation and difference. Now, comparing herself to an abandoned house, maison abandonnée, uh, in which someone throws open all the windows and lets in l'air et la lumière, um, air and light, I would say that disorientation becomes reorientation. Um, since she now slowly learns to be happy, à être heureuse, and happy with her identity. Now, having regained uh, the self-assurance um, that she experienced as a child before being stigmatized as different, she becomes someone who translates herself into other cultural codes. Un être qui se traduit dans d'autres codes culturels. And yes, after a successful uh, in vitro fertilization, she becomes pregnant and her pregnant body uh, represents the encounter between cultures and contains past, present and future, which is now 
willing and able to share with others. Now, a few concluding sentences, a few concluding reflections here. Um, I have focused, of course, in this presentation on some particular elements uh, of the texts. Um, and as a disclaimer, I would like to mention that many more important elements uh, are developed in these rich books. Um, but in view of the topic uh, of today, um, I have discussed these three elements of self-assessment, making the self and expressing the self. Um, that allow for a rich comparison of the two books. Now, what does this mean um, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, countering stereotypes uh, on, on, on different levels? Both protagonists go through the same phases, um, but I would argue that there is a countering of stereotypes at different levels. So with regard to gender and sexuality, um, the clear gender distinction that Kimia has learned to accept as a child in Iran is counted when she comes to terms with her hybrid body, with her lesbianism, and the stereotypical image of the exoticized oriental woman um, in Max et la Poupée, uh, which uh, Mariam presents, is ultimately countered by Mariam herself when she takes off her mask and tells the stories from within, showing a genuine picture of contemporary Iran. On the level of cultural stereotypes, I would say that the refusal to eat and to speak demonstrates an um, irreconcilable gap, seems to demonstrate an irreconcilable gap between the two cultures. A gap is, con that gap is confirmed when the protagonists are confronted with their grammatical errors, with their very limited view on Iranian culture that the French have. But my argument is that by translating their pain into stories, both narrators gain agency over their bodies and over their futures. And by destabilizing these monolithic categories of identity, creating new images um, of womanhood, I think they defy cultural stereotypes, French as well as Iranian uh, stereotypes, and assume also the role of mediator. So the protagonists' mi uh, migrant bodies and encounters offer the possibility of becoming cultural transmitters or translators of cultural experiences maybe, through which ultimately um, a reconciliation between cultures possibly uh, is, 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 is possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Janet. It was extremely interesting and we shall move to the discussion. Uh, I can't see any questions in the chat, but should you, ah, yes, yeah, Scott. I can see your hand raised, so please turn on your microphone and start speaking. Well, that was uh, actually an applause, but I also have a question. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank uh, you. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I was curious if the, uh, the reception of uh, Iranians uh, around the world differed pre-revolution, post-revolution, and then after the revolution, was there, there a difference in the 80s and the 90s, et cetera? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, the, 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 thank you for your question. Uh, Post-revolution, um, particularly um, in the US, uh, that's actually where we find the most research in the United States, post-revolutionary. Um, these uh, authors, particularly the women authors uh, from the Iranian diaspora, are uh, considered um, a voice that is also presented as a new or orientalist voice. Uh, so as a voice to uh, criticize um, the, the, the post-revolutionary Iranian religious culture. 